Um, so we have a couple housekeeping items to uh, get started with before we uh, get into the uh, sessions today. So uh, real quick, we do this at the beginning of each of our meetings, um, talk a little bit about kind of what our community stands for, um, some of the pillars that we like to kind of emphasize uh, during these meetings and during our get togethers. Uh, we really like this community um, to be collaborative. Um, that's one thing that we found um, the, the greater Tableau community. That's one of the things we found is one of their strengths to collaborate, share ideas, share thoughts. Um, and we want to kind of mimic that or mirror that in our, our North Texas community as well. Uh, one thing that's been tough um, kind of during our quarantine uh, COVID days is networking. But once we get back to in-person sessions, um, that goal will maybe be a little bit easier to do uh, once we're able to kind of meet and greet and you know share a drink with each other. One of the other things we like to emphasize during these events is spread the word. Uh, the more folks we have participating, the more ideas, the more thoughts we have in the room, the better. Um, I know I've learned folks, you know, learn things from folks who have only been using the tool, you know, zero to six months. So <clears throat> there's never a, a bad idea. There's never a bad question. Um, so feel free, uh, share this with your coworkers, share this with your friends, uh, the more the better. And uh, finally, one of uh, the last goals of our community is to have fun. Uh, we like to, you know, have uh, pretty relaxed meetings. Um, if you've ever attended one of our in-person events, you know, we, we have drinks, wine, beer. We have a pretty relaxed environment. So um, we like to like to emphasize uh, that we're here to have fun. We're here to learn. If you've ever been to a Tableau conference, you'll know that's what that's all about as well. Um, having fun, uh, you know, kicking back and, and uh, learning a thing or two while, uh, while having a beverage. So, um, Again, before we jump into kind of the, the meat and potatoes, so to speak, of our event today, I do want to introduce our team. Uh, Joey, uh, do you want to do you want to introduce yourself? Oh, you're on yeah, board. you're doing good, man. Go for it. All right. Um, so Joey, <laughs> Joey leads this group. Jerry Ramos founded this group. Uh, what are we going on? Three years? Is that right? Three and a half years. Yeah, three years in January. Yeah. So I, I joined up uh, about two years ago and uh, have helping uh, been uh, been helping lead this group for about uh, about two years. Um, when we meet in person, we do so in Plano at the Legacy West area. Um, we were starting to find that uh, the work required to kind of maintain the the group and the community was too much for two people. So we've added a couple folks in the past uh, two or three months. Um, so, if those of you that don't know Stephen and Brandy, I want to introduce uh, them to you now. Stephen and Brandy, you want to say hi? Hello. Hey, everyone. So, Stephen is uh, with WeWork, and I believe, uh, are you out of the WeWork in Plano, Stephen? Is that right? Um, I work remotely for WeWork now, but I okay. used to manage the WeWork out in Plano. Excellent. And Brandy, you are with uh, Allstate. And are you in... Uh, are you in, you're in Ar Arlington, is that right? Uh, the office is in Irving, but I recently switched to remote as well. Gotcha. Excellent. Yeah, we are, we're pretty pumped to have Stephen and Brandy. Um, they bring a lot to the table and uh, they'll be part of our leadership team going forward. So one quick shout out, however, uh, Stephen was uh, just recently recognized in the newest cohort of Tableau Public featured authors. So if, you, uh, if you're on Tableau Public, you have a profile on there, I would definitely recommend you following Steven. Um, so shout out to Steven. Uh, he has an awesome profile on there. Uh, a lot of great work. Um, pretty active participant in Makeover Monday. Is that right, Steven? So uh, quick question before we get going. Have you, <laughs> how's your life changed? Have you gotten a, a bunch of new followers on Public or on Twitter? Yeah, I've had a, a, a few followers, but I, I think the only thing that's really changed is uh, I feel more pressure to uh, <laughs> stuff. So I, I'm constantly thinking of new ideas and uh, new techniques. So got to keep the, the iron sharp. Um, I, I, I think that's a phrase, right? <laughs> How's that? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah man, I, I love your work. I'm super pumped for you that uh, you got featured author. I was kind of surprised it took this long, to be completely candid. Um, but yeah, folks, if you're out there in Tableau Public, go follow Steven. Some really cool stuff out there. 
Uh, finally, uh, one last thing I want to uh, mention before we get started is Tableau has shared a new uh, free e-learning uh, class. It is uh, focused around data literacy. Um, you do need at least a Tableau e-learning login to access it, which I'm going to do now. Give me just a second here. While you're doing that, Stephen, I saw you're a horror movie fan. What would you recommend with Halloween coming up? Oh boy, that's a that's a big question. Um, let's see. It depends on what you like in terms of scary movies, but I, I'd say a recent scary movie that just came out that is is good for Halloween if you like those slasher films is a, a movie called Spree. It was a guy from uh, Stranger Things who plays the babysitter. He plays like an Instagram streaming obsessed uh, kid who wants to go viral. So he starts doing um, some not good things to people to try and make himself go viral. Um, very funny movie but also um, very appropriate for Halloween, I think. <laughs> All right, I'll have to check it out. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so the, uh, the data literacy program, uh, like I mentioned, it's free, covers everything from a foundational understanding of what data literacy is and should be, all the way down to correlation and uh, regression analysis. So a lot of cool stuff there. Um, recommend you going to check it out. I've just started kind of watching um, through the sessions um, so I'll, once I get through them all, I'll give everyone kind of uh, my feedback and, and what I thought. Hey, Tim, can you uh, click on that first one there? Yeah, this one here? Okay. Yeah, I just want to take a look. I haven't been here. Before. How long is the, uh, the course? Through? That I don't know. Okay. Don't know. Cool. I'll have to check it out. Now there it is, 30, 45 minutes. Oh, yeah. Cool. yeah and that's cool. just this one session. Uh, I think there were seven in, in yeah. total. All right, so Joey, did you want to kind of uh, walk us through the agenda today? Absolutely, yeah, let's get started. So uh, now that you guys have met the team, it's gonna be a virtual agenda right here. We've got a pretty good agenda for you guys today. Uh, so I think Tim is gonna do a quick uh, Tableau PC20 virtual uh, The next, Brandy and just uh, the of the day, how to own that recognition with the PAC, the operations that they uh, And then the next, uh, Stephen, who is a newly featured author, will uh, discuss how to sort of jazz up your cross uh, He actually had a post probably about, uh, I don't know, a couple of months ago, maybe a month ago. You either saw it on LinkedIn or on Twitter that um, he had a cross tab there and it was uh, a lot of nice little features there um, that sort of made that cross tab high. So uh, I'm excited to see his presentation today. And then at the, uh, the end here, Tim's going to do Tableau Tip of the Month. I sent him a note this morning. I was like, hey, we got a new Tip of the Month. Uh, he's like, don't worry, I got something planned. He was very cryptic. He didn't tell me what it was. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, so that was uh, maybe an oversight of my part. Uh, we're going to do some uh, dynamic axes, uh, something I picked up from uh, the community forums. There were some questions on there about how to do that. So I'm going to walk through that using parameters and a couple of, couple of calculations. Let's start. All right. So first thing we're going to talk about today is a recap of conference. Um, so I'm going to provide some uh, some resources, talk about some of the updates coming out. Um, but I want to keep this open ended. I want to keep it a more more of a discussion than anything. So, Joey, Stephen, Brandy, feel free to kind of jump in here uh, with your thoughts about Tableau Conference or you know any sessions you found valuable uh, throughout the three days. Uh, so what I'm going to do is pop over to one of my other screens here. <clears throat> so. Course conference was earlier this month, um, three days, 200 something countries. Uh, the crazy part was over 100,000 attendees. Um, normally we, we do kind of live uh, conferences. We're, we're looking at 20,000 ish. So it's awesome that we're able to get that many folks um, 
kind of in there learning, finding out new information, right? Learning about Einstein or data literacy or whatever tracks they were interested in. So that was really great folks that wouldn't have normally been able to attend uh, for them to get to experience at least to some degree what conference is like is really awesome. So uh, first and foremost, this, uh, this PowerPoint on the right um, has quite a few links to uh, resources about conference. We'll share these links on our, or these uh, resources on our LinkedIn profile uh, this afternoon in our LinkedIn group. So if you're part of that, um, be on the lookout. If you're not, uh, go ahead and join us. It's the Real North Texas Tableau uh, user group. And there'll, there'll be a slide at the end uh, where we'll share that uh, the social media information. But uh, first and foremost, I want to call out that any of the sessions um, from conference are available to watch on demand. So if you go to uh, tc20.tableau.com, go to the episode guide, and you'll see here uh, all the sessions and the tracks that are available to watch on demand. Um, quite a few here. Uh, personally, I was interested in, in Einstein. So I watched a lot of, uh, you know, how Einstein Analytics, which is a Salesforce, um, a Salesforce tool originally, how it's going to work with Tableau going forward and uh, what we should expect. I watch a lot of speed tipping from Zen Masters. Those are always interesting. Uh, so if you're looking uh, to pick up some quick tips, uh, tips and tricks, those are some cool sessions to watch. Um, uh, Joey, Stephen, Brandy, did you guys uh, did you have any sessions that you found worthwhile? Brandy, do you want to go? I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was actually going to say speed tipping as well on mine. Um, that was actually my first Tableau conference experience. And so um, really enjoyed that in Iron Viz, uh, but I was partial to speed tipping. I'm pretty direct. And so I like just getting straight to the point and learning a ton of stuff all at once. So that's awesome. Yeah. And for me, um, it was actually the dashboard. Uh, the, I think it was the financial dashboard with Kate um, and I believe Mark. Uh, they were walking through actually creating dashboard and for me i'm always thinking about how to use tableau in my my actual work and, and so i love those uh any anything that can teach me new tricks and I, I learned a lot from those inspired me to post my own dashboard right after that so that was a really awesome session yeah absolutely i don't remember the title of that um but that was katie wagner mark bradhorn uh that was definitely one uh, was of human resources sessions. what's that oh, was it human resources related uh, yeah. It was regarding insurance. Insurance. Um, shoot. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to find it now that I'm probably just searching. There it is. Anatomy of a Dashboard Financial Services. Uh, that Yeah, that was one of my favorite sessions as well. They did a really good job with that presentation. And uh, for anyone that follows Mark on, uh, on Twitter, he put in a little Easter egg that he was... <laughs> He was pretty proud of, and he was uh, he was waiting for someone to find that Easter egg. So, if you end up watching that uh, watching that session, be on the lookout uh, for something he snuck in there. But uh, what about you, Joey? Were you able to uh, to watch any of the sessions or catch up on on some of this? Uh, yeah, music? I watched them. I watched them after. So I was pretty busy those couple of days. I hit the keynotes. Uh, Des on stage is always great. Uh, Iron Viz is fun. I did see Katie's. So uh, you mentioned uh, devs on stage or rebranded to devs on desk uh, this year. That's always one of my favorite sessions at, um, at live conferences. That's one of the most exciting things for you know, kind of the seasoned Tableau folks, right? It's to find out about new features, um, new things that are coming to desktop prep. Yeah, can you uh, skip down to... Sorry, go ahead. Can you skip down to slide 11? Can you skip down to slide 11 on the PowerPoint? Yeah. Maybe. There it goes. Oh, perfect. Yeah, just what we were talking about. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is some. Uh, yeah, so these are some of the newer features that they discussed. Uh, 
Go ahead, Tim. Sorry. Yeah, no, it's okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah, these are some of the new features that were discussed on um, uh, Devs at Desk. Uh, what is also going to reference? Um, again, we'll share we'll share this resource uh, with the with the uh, LinkedIn group. But there was also a great blog post that was written up by Innerworks, uh, kind of covering each one of these new items. Um, one of the things that I'm most excited about, or a couple of other things, are uh, the new desktop features. So there is the three of them that I want to talk about are uh, the changes to the predictive um, uh, predictive modeling that's in Tableau, right? So the forecasting. Uh, they're adding some features where you can uh, choose how long you want that forecast to to uh, trend out. So that's great. That's uh, That's been kind of missing um, for the last uh, few years, really. Um, the other thing that was that was pretty exciting was the multiple map layers. Uh, for those of you that that uh, you know do a lot of mapping in Tableau, any sort of uh, geospatial analysis, you'll know that to any to add layers, you have to do, do a lot of dual axis, right? Uh, dual axis with the latitude and longitude. So this update, when it comes out, will uh, let you add additional marks cards um, to the viz, where you can, as you see there, he's got. Uh, um, it's grouped by zip code, and then the white is uh, possible houses or rental rental properties. And I think the red squares, if I remember right, were uh, coffee shops, right? So he was looking at, uh, you know, possible places you could move within <laughs> a reasonable distance of a coffee a coffee shop. So um, it was a really cool uh, session to see uh, kind of how these new features would work. And I think the the one that that is going to get most people excited is the uh, easy LODs. Um, those are probably the number one thing that folks struggle with kind of in the intermediate space is uh, how to write an effective LOD, when to use it, how to use it, um, whether to use fix or include or exclude. Uh, so I think this will help a lot of folks. As you can see here, it's eventually going to be uh, just a couple of clicks to get your new LOD, um, very similar to you know how we do calculated fields now. So exciting stuff. Um, there's some more around prep um, and uh, ask data and some server updates as well. I don't want to get too far into that because uh, I want to make sure we save enough time uh, for the rest of our content today. That's something we'll cover in a future meeting. But uh, a lot of cool stuff. The devs on stage or devs at desk rather is one of the sessions you can go back and watch. Uh, so if you're into that sort of thing, if you want to see those new features, I'd recommend you go check that out. Uh, with that, um, I think that's all. Oh, you know, I'm sorry. One one other thing. Uh, with Tableau Conference being virtual, um, Tableau wanted to find a way to showcase work. So if you've ever been to a live in-person Tableau Conference, there is a part of the venue, a part of the conference hall that's dedicated to Tableau Public and uh, sharing the work that's been published throughout the year. What they did this year was a virtual gallery. Um, and this is really cool. Uh, this is, uh, again, if you see my URL, bizgallery.tablepublic.com. And you can actually walk throughout the gallery, take a look at some of the work featured. Um, there's a Iron Viz section from uh, some of the work that was featured during the Iron Viz event. Uh, from the three uh, contestants there. So uh, quite a bit here, some really cool Viz of the Days. Um, if you're not familiar with Viz of the Day, that is, uh, well, exactly what it sounds like. It's a Viz that uh, the, the public team picks each day to be, uh, to be featured on Tableau Public. And so that actually is a perfect uh, segue into our next section or next session rather. Uh, what I'm gonna do is bring in Brandy. Um, for those, again, for those of you not familiar with Visit the Day, why we wanna showcase this today is Visit the Day is a really good learning opportunity. Um, when I first started, one of the first things I subscribed to when I first started with Tableau is uh, Visit the Day. What I would do is I'd get those in my email every day, I'd subscribe to them, and I would go in Tableau Public, download it, and tear it apart to see if I could recreate it, find out what the original author did, and uh, some of the tips or tricks that they're using in that viz. So it's a really great learning opportunity, and uh, 
Brandy is here with one of the recent Visit the Day, um, uh, one of the folks that was recently recognized, recognized for Visit the Day to kind of talk through that process and uh, how that Visit the Day was created. So with that, um, sorry, it was a long-winded explanation. I'm going to uh, pass it off to Brandy. All right, thanks, Tim. Yeah. All right, so I'm very excited to introduce you guys to our guest today. Uh, his name is Patrick Sarsfield. He works with me at Allstate as a Tableau developer. He's also been my Tableau mentor for the last couple of years and just a friend and just a super nice guy. So a really good person to get to know. Um, he recently did a viz about the life of Anthony Bourdain and uh, it won Visit the Day on Tableau Public on September 22nd. And so be sure to check out his Tableau Public profile as well as follow him on Twitter. His handle I think is at Patty Scarsfield. We'll put it in the chat and then obviously connect with him on LinkedIn too. But um, welcome, Pat. We're excited to have you. And if you want to go ahead and thank you. Read and we'll get started. I just want to say, first off, Stephen, I'm really, first of all, thank, congratulations. But also, I really appreciate your honest response to like the comment of like, hey, this is great. This is amazing. And you're like, yeah, it is. But like now I really feel the pressure is on. And so like, I, 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 there's something about an honest response to that question, which you could just, you could have not said what you really felt. And so thank you for being like, like true to, like, that's kind of what I wanted to hear too. Is like, oh, I mean, is he a human being? He doesn't even seem like he's mortal. Has he put out so much stuff? So thank you for that. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks. Thanks, Patrick. All right, Pat, are you sharing your screen? Not yet. Sorry about that. Go ahead. Okay, no worries. You know when you guys can see my screen. All right, we can see it. Okay. Perfect. So, Pat, would you go ahead and tell us what inspired this biz? So, I have been a fan of Anthony Bourdain for a long time. I mean, I. I read his books. You know, I read, I, I should say, I read about half of his nonfiction books. So starting off with The Kitchen Confidential and just going from there. I watched most of his shows, a lot of episodes of his shows. But I think more so than that than just being a like casual fan was um, about five or six years ago, um, Anthony Bourdain really got in, obsessed with the jiu-jitsu. And that was largely because of his wife, Octavia, um, who was a, a brown belt at the time, uh, out of uh, Hento Gracie's. So that doesn't mean very much, but his, his daughter and his and his and uh, and his wife were trying to pull him in to jujitsu, and he just was very resistant for about five years. And eventually, he broke, and he became again a huge ambassador for the sport. It's a very small sport, so losing him, uh, people like him, Paul Walker, also um, a big big uh, advocate of the sport, was a really big deal. And so when I walked into the gym after he passed away, it was like walking to funeral parlor. It was it was really, I was really bummed out. And so it kind of impacted me. And I I met Octavia. I never met Anthony and I got, it was on the things where the community is so small, you could roll into Henzo's if you're in New York and like there's a, you know that he trains twice a day. He probably does one private, he probably does one open class. You could probably roll with Anthony, Anthony Bourdain. Like there's a, there's a likelihood that that could happen. You know, that it, it's one of those cool things. You can't play basketball with Michael Jordan, but like you could go to Hollywood BJJ and if you want to meet John Patrick Flannery, you can go meet him. That might be a little obscure for some people, but that's generally how I felt about it. So I was, I was impacted by this in the sense that I was like, wow, someone that is pretty monumental, at least in a, sub a subculture that I'm deeply entrenched in, passed away. And I couldn't even, I was like, I found this, when, when this, this was first put out, it was a Makeover Monday data set, right? In 2018, uh, just shortly after you passed away. And I looked at it, I had it saved in, you know, data.world for, I don't know, two, over two years. And I just kept on coming back to the, I, I would go to the well and I would have nothing um, that I could think of to, that would, Kind of be a good representation of, of this man's life um and i think that's it comes comes from like a stance of like you know i was i think i was just reading something by joshua smith about like empathy I was like, so, so I, was, I felt like i felt like a real real a real desire to like do this well and so i just but i but i wanted to do it but i just kept on putting it to the on the back burner and it wasn't really until i, I read a guest blog post by uh wendy shaija that i was like i think i have an idea here and and then i started my process you know like sketching it out and and going from there Hey, Randy, I think you're on mute. Sorry. We've identified my new habit. All right. 
Thank you. <laughs> um, so that actually transitions well into the next question. Would you go ahead and describe your development process and your thoughts on achieving Biz of the Day? So, so on on a, a achieving Biz of the Day, and I, this is like I actually think I think Stephen can definitely relate this because he's won it twice. Um, it's one of those things where, at least from myself, like it, it's not expected. Like it's great. Like I was, it was definitely, I was definitely thrilled that it happened. But like the expectation was always like, there's so much stuff that gets submitted and put up on public, and there's so many talented people that the likelihood is like very low. So like, if your goal is to win Biz, biz of the Day, um, or like let's say become a telepublic and tele ambassador or a featured author, like if that's your only goal, you're probably gonna be disappointed. You know, it's like that should not be the. Re I mean, at least that isolate. That's not the reason why I do it because I would burn out way too quickly. So what I generally find that helps is like, I just find things that I'm just generally already interested in and, and I just pursue that. Um, in regards to like my development process, I, um, I generally start off, so I, I, was, I definitely had, was intimately familiar with the data because I was always going back to look at it. Um, I'd probably look at it every once a quarter to see if I had something to, that I could provide. And I was never happy with what, what I was what I coming up with at the time. So just kind of put it back on the back burner. Um, but my process is once I had my idea, once I went read Wendy's blog and started putting something together in my mind, I just I wireframed it, you know, or sketched it out. I mean, people use a lot of words like prototyping, wireframing, storyboarding, whatever you want to call it. It's a it's like a fancy way of at least for me of saying I just I drew a really rudimentary picture, um, and then I and then I generally try to adhere to it. I uh, I have children, so I think my daughter actually drew all over my uh, my Anthony Bourdain dash uh, prototype. But I like Stephen. Like I'm always working on something, so I have a side project I'm working on. Um, let me, can you guys see, let me share my screen, uh, like my actual screen. Let's see if I don't screw this up too bad. So what I want to do is share my, video. well, let me hold it up. If that'll work before I screw this up. I don't know if you can see this, but it's like, it's very, it's like, you know, it looks like a maybe sixth grader drew it. And so what I have here um, is I, I basically found some data on uh, CompuBox data. So I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of uh, martial arts or fighting, whatever, That's things of that nature. I found some CompuBox data and I really wanted to create a dashboard. And so the wireframe here is just basically a outline kind of like the poster for the Thrill in Manila. And so I have my the two individuals, I have their names. I have a Veroni chart, which I think I nicknamed with Autumn. I don't know if anyone in the community is aware of Autumn. She's awesome. Nicknamed a, um, what you call it? A turtle shell chart, which I think is actually a much more uh, memorable name. And then I have down here, a um, essentially like an area graph, an area chart here, and then some selections. So what I want to do, I want to show you that because I want to see how closely I adhered to that in this. I think I, if I'm just guessing off the top of my head, I think I probably stuck to about, 60, maybe 70% of what I just showed you. Let me go down real quick. So this is this is still like in uh, like kind of like user acceptance testing, but just to give you an idea of like how closely, like I try to stick to my initial prototype or sketch. So here, um, same like outline here, you can see like I have the two individuals, I have their names. Um, I have a different chart here. So I did add that in. Um, I then do have the Veroni down here. Uh, I included a couple of those charts as well. But still pretty close, so still about sixty percent, I'd say. And then down at the bottom, I did include the the last piece, the kind of like uh, modified area chart. So, I mean, I really do try to stick close to it. Um, one thing is about storyboarding that's really helpful is that if you get distracted or lost or kind of go into the weeds, you can always just pick up your, your poor sketch or poor poor attempt at drawing something and say like, where was I going again? And it kind of centers you and refocus, focuses your mind. It's like, what am I actually trying to do here? And is what I'm doing actually relevant or am I just going down like a, the wrong path? So I, I, I largely believe in it. I know that a lot of people, I, I know a lot of people do it, but I think what has never worked for me just starting with no real plan. It, 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 occasion, I guess it can, but it's generally, it's like what I always tell people when I'm training them is it's a lot easier to get someplace when you've got a map and what a sketch or a wireframe or a prototype or whatever you want to call it represents is like a really rudimentary map. And so if you take the straight route or you take a circuitous route, you're still going to be better off. Well, I definitely think if you find the one that your daughter helped with, you should post that on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, it's probably got a lot of sparkles <laughs> on it. 
Um, let's see. So would you talk a little bit about your philosophy on how to utilize Tableau Public? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think like a lot of people, I use Tableau Public just kind of like, like Tim was talking about, like I go there for inspiration. Uh, I go there for new ideas and then I favorite them or save them or follow authors that I find to be compelling. But like even more so, like I think one of the things that, that you know about me is that I kind of use Tableau Public as a repository for good ideas and, and things that I don't want to forget. So I kind of embed things in there that may not even necessarily need to be there. And it's just because I, I know that at some point I'm going to want it and I won't necessarily always know where to find it. And if I kind of put it in there, put it into a dashboard, maybe maybe it's effective, maybe it's doing something, maybe it's not. Um, I'll always have that with me. Like if I was to lose my job tomorrow uh, and they took my laptop, and they took my desktop away, I would still have my tablet public and I would still have all that information retained out there. So I kind of look at it as like a, a nice, you know, like, Sit, like I'm like hedging my bets a little bit. I don't expect to be fired, but if I was, I wouldn't be completely on the cold. Uh, I also have a problem with like remembering things. So uh, I, I saw Ryan Sleeper speak um, when he was promoting his first book at the Chicago Tele User Group. And he, he said, I must've been a lot smarter. He's trying to he's trying to do something. He couldn't remember how to do it. So there's a context. And he said, I must've been a lot smarter a few years ago because I can't remember how he did this. And like just Ryan saying that was like, it, it was like a mental weight was lifted off my shoulders. Like, oh, like, even Ryan Sleeper forgets how to do things. I'm like, I guess it's okay if I don't know how to do some something sometimes and I have to go look it up. Because I, I think sometimes there's a thing where you beat yourself up because you can't remember how to, I don't know, make like a uh, like a bump chart or something. You're like, oh, this is so easy. I should know how to do this. And you're just like skipping a step you're trying to do too quickly. And it's almost like you feel like you, you screwed up by having to go look it up because you can't remember it. But I just remind myself like, hey, Ryan, forget stuff too. I guess it's okay. I'll go Google it real quickly. It'll take me two minutes and I'll figure it out and I'll be fine. But it kind of like centers me again. So I, I share that with you because I thought the same thing like Steve, and I think it was a very honest, um, very honest feedback of exactly what's going on in his mind. He didn't, he could have said something different, but he didn't. He said exactly what he, what he thought. And it was like, to me, like that is like, that's very important. And that's what, one of the things that's great about the community. People are very honest and open and willing to share. For sure. I think we can all relate to that on some level. And so I've personally been able to witness Pat uh, kind of put this in action. You know, if there's a Maybe like a day parameter calculation we're trying to remember, you know, like, oh, we've done it in Tableau Public, so let's go check that down. It's very handy to use, you know, kind of both ways. It helps out in the practical business side as well as the public side, so it's great. Yeah, and uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. I, I look up everything all the time, so for <laughs> I, Pat was saying as though, you know, he forgets like how to make a bump chart. Sometimes I forget how to like format text, so <laughs> let's <here. laughs> Yeah, it is, I mean, I feel, I hope that people on the line like hear this and they're like, oh, like, okay. And it's like, they're like, we all have, I and mean, like, I was, I recently re was rereading um, Andy Kirk's The Seven Hats of, of Data Visualization. And it's like so helpful to remember that's like, we don't wear all the hats, or like almost nobody wears all the hats. And I bet if you ask most Zen masters if they wear all seven of those hats, they'd say most of them are, would probably give the same honest feeling. They'd say like, maybe wear four or five of them. But there's certainly two that I'm very weak at or they struggle at, even though you would, our perception would be like, they're great at everything. And so realizing that people are human, that everyone has certain skill sets and you can lean into those core competencies. And there's other things they're not so great at. And if you're honest about that, it makes life so much easier. Because there are yeah. definitely things that Brandy knows that I'm not great at. Like, I, like I'm okay at LODs, but I'm very thrilled that they're, com that they're going to make it a little bit easier for me because it'll lighten the load a bit for me. And, and just to kind of uh, echo that point, um, you know, there are Zen masters out there who, who openly kind of admit that they, they, they've created their blog just so they can remember things. Um, if I remember right, I think it was Kevin Furlash who said that, or I'll have to go back and look, but he, whoever it was, they said, hey, I write the blog for me, right? It's, it's so I can remember and I can document and it's great that they find, other people find these things helpful. So just kind of, uh, you know, echo your point and Think there's a lot of value in that. Absolutely. So Pat, let's uh, jump back to the dashboard a little bit. Sure. Will you give us a little tour and then maybe describe how you made the map chart? Yeah, so let me, I'll walk you through like the overall dashboard and then I'll show you the part that probably, I, th I think probably people were more um, interested in. But I mean, in general, it was just supposed to be, I mean, this is supposed to be here like a, a menu, right? Because, uh, hang on a second. So that'll load back up again. There's supposed to be like a menu feature, so you open it up just like you're going to a restaurant. Okay. Okay, and so if you guys didn't know, Anthony Bourdain was a chef for far longer than he was anything else for decades. Um, that's where he cut his cut his teeth. I think that's the right saying. So here, here's something. If this, you can take this or leave it. I mean, it wasn't necessary. That's why I kind of hit it. I'm not a big believer in just throwing text up, just throw text up. 
I think I think you guys have had uh, Daria Voronova speak here before. She had a really, really good dashboard where she put this in. And I thought the terminology she used was so great. She's like, you want to avoid visual vomit. And like I, I let it, I was like, oh, that's an interesting way to put it. And as I thought about it, I was like, what does she mean by that? I was like, I think what she meant was you don't want to just throw up stuff on the screen, right? And that's a big problem. And I think sometimes when, especially in a work environment, you see people and they do, and then sometimes the, the idea that like someone will just put up a lot of things, like just a lot of a lot of uh, numbers on a screen, and people are like, oh my gosh, that must be very complicated. That must be they must be so good. And I think the real trick is that you really only need the information that you need and just more it's, it's just like a Edward Tufte quote, um, you want to maximize your data to ink ratio. So you want to reduce the amount of, the, reduce the cognitive load on people. You want to reduce the amount of stuff they're looking at. So why am I hiding this kind of excerpt from, you know, the New York Times? Because it's very long and maybe some people aren't big on reading. It's like, you don't have to read to appreciate this dashboard. There's also some filters here. If you don't want to filter it, you just want to appreciate it for what it is. You don't have to engage with this at all. It just kind of gives a little additional layer of context, as well as I think I, I put in a song here. This is the last song that, that uh, Tony tweeted out. Um, on, on Twitter, uh, it was for an episode that was coming up on, uh, and it's, it's kind of it's kind of eerie. I listened to it several times um, while I was doing this. It's kind of an eerie song, uh, but it, it, I think it fits well with this. So I try to add, incorporate fun stuff like video and, and music into what I'm doing, because I'm, as I'm doing this, I'm also kind of, you know, watching, I'm like watching the episodes or I'm, you know, in this, in the previous biz I showed before, I was like, I'm watching like every, you know, every, every fight of this trilogy over and over again, um, kind of like embedding myself in with, within uh, what I'm doing. Uh, so what I have here is after the the background is just a Figma background. So this top piece here is just a Figma background. Uh, let me actually go into it because I can pull stuff out. It's because what I was like, kind of like Tim says, like, I like it to demystify things because things always look really complicated. And you're it's oftentimes surprising how, it, some, well, sometimes you're surprised at how much is going on. And sometimes you're surprised at how how much how much more manageable it does seem once you get digging a little bit deeper and, uh, and kind of get your feet wet. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna strip out the Figma background and then you'll just see that there's a lot of smoke and mirrors going on here and it looks like it's already missing. So that's helpful. So this, the background here is a, is a Figma background. It was a Figma background uh, and I should have it in here, sorry. And you guys are familiar with Figma. You, you place Figma with whatever your preferred UI UX software is. Could be Adobe XD, could be Sketch, could be PowerPoint. A lot of people use PowerPoint. Um, so here is, here's the background. And this is just, this is something I actually learned from um, Chantilly Juggernaut. And it was only earlier this year that, and that I, I, I think Draney, I did our research on it. We were trying to see, is Figma we should use? Cause we didn't want to overcommit to something for we really new. After reading a bunch on it, I landed on Figma. I also just a big Chantilly fan, but I landed on Figma based off kind of what I was reading and the ability to share as a team. And the fact that it's also free to use an individual. But I mean, I know a lot of people use Adobe XD and I know a lot of even like Zen masters still prefer to use uh, PowerPoint. Uh, so, I mean, really, it's the, the, the only point here is that you're basically just creating a custom background to make this look a little cooler. Let's see. Uh, then the next piece, oh, there's my thing with background. So the next piece was actually a, um, a map. So I created a, a map box map, a very simple one. And I, I kind of was thinking about this, like, again, like I was thinking back about like uh, Tony's life and so one of the things I was reading, I remember reading his books, I was like, you know, oftentimes the best chefs use the fewest, oh my goodness, use the fewest ingredients. And so the goal here was to actually make a really, really simple map that's straight into the point. It keeps the focal point on the, um, the curvy line graph, which was really the, what I wanted to be, be the focal point. And so this was just really as simple as possible, but it was I, all credit to Johnny because I thought I knew Mapbox um, before, but once Johnny Walker really laid out the, the guidelines to like how to really create a custom app in Figma, not just modify an already existing one, it opened up um, Pandora's box. So I love working with maps um, as much as I can. This is only three layers, really simple. It's transparent in the back. So what's coming through here, uh, what's coming through here, Oh, sorry, it's coming through here is actually the um, the background, and then everything else is just th that's essentially a lighter a lightish black is the water, uh, and then I just overlaid um, what was it a country the country lines over it, so that's like I'm sorry that's the that's kind of all the other stuff that's going on behind the scenes with this um, curvy line craft. I mean this this required me to actually go like figure it out and. So all the people I just mentioned, like this was this the curvy lines came from Wendy Shija, the Mapbox stuff came from uh, Johnny Walker, and 
the, the idea of using Figma came from Chantilly Jagannath. And like, what do all three of these individuals have in common? It's that they're all, they are, are all like open on public, on public and on uh, Twitter. And they just demystify the process. They showed how to bridge the gaps. So it's like, well, how do I incorporate? It's like, I like this idea of using a UI, UX software to make my backgrounds look cool. And I, and I know Tableau, but how do I connect that together? And what Chantilly did with Figma was she connected those dots. And then all, as soon as I knew how to do that, I was off to the races, but it required someone to just like show me how to do that. What did Johnny Walker do? Johnny Walker demystified how to use Mapbox. You know, there's he's a video on, on YouTube right now that you can watch. It's fantastic. And he shows how do you connect the dots between Mapbox and Tableau. Two things that otherwise you might, like there's a there's a hurdle in occasionally, like um, oftentimes in getting to that next step where you're like, well, I want to use both or I like both, but how do I put them together? Johnny showed you how to put them together. Perfect. When you do the same thing with this, like I had a basic understanding of data densification from uh, Ken Flairledge and Here's, I'll give you like a, I, I can't go do, too deep in this because I'm, this is like way beyond me in terms of math. Like this is basically me painting my numbers, but I do know that uh, the, the, the core point that I had, the core thing that I had to understand was I'm looking at two marks here. Uh, what I want to do is connect those two. And that's just a regular line graph. But what I'm trying to do here is I want to make this curvy. So how do I go about doing that? Uh -oh. It requires data densification. So essentially what you need to do is you need to add a lot more than two points. So this is where I move this out of the way. This is where you're adding in as many points as you need. I think Wendy went up to like a hundred. You can add more. Um, but what you're seeing here is this is still a straight line. There's just a lot more points than two added here. Now when you take that same idea and you put it on a curvy line, like adding a, a sigmoid function, when I have, it looks like a it looks like a curvy line. But I think the, the thing that I had to wrap my brain around, which was kind of the, the biggest part when I first started looking at just even curvy lines in general was, oh my goodness, it's just lots of little straight lines broken up so so small that they appear to be curving because my eyes can't tell the difference. And like that, that revelation I think was my first entry into like, okay, how can I do this? And then what Wendy did in her blog, and I think it'd probably be best for me to direct you towards that. It's actually under uh, Ken and Kevin's website here. And it's called, let me, uh, drawing curvy lines on a, on a map in Tableau. So pretty straightforward actually in terms of title. But uh, what, what Wendy did is she demystified, okay, well, how do you take that idea of like, okay, now how to create a curvy line now, but how do I put it on a map? And she bridged that gap again. And so what you see is like all these people sharing all these things, like I would really not have been any, I would not have been able to do any of this if it wasn't for all three of them being willing to share how to kind of do these things that uh, separately, you know, separately are still very interesting, but putting them all together it kind of helped to tell the story that I wanted to tell. And so I think that I look at this and I think back on um, uh, Austin Kleon's book, uh, Steal Like an Artist, which has nothing to do with data visualization, but everything to do with like taking good ideas. It's just taking these ideas, these good ideas, and just kind of making them your own, meshing them together and seeing what you can develop with that. And so, yeah, if you just take something and copy someone's dashboard or biz and paste it into your profile, I, I know that um, there have been some Zen masters that call people doing that. Like that is certainly something that you're going to, get into trouble with, but um, what the heck's going on here? But uh, yeah, I, if, you, if you're just taking something and making it your own and massaging it and modifying it a, a bit or good, even a good deal to really make sure that, you know, you're just kind of doing this person, like honoring this person, whatever they put out there, whatever they shared, and then ideally giving them credit back and, and kind of as a thank you, then I think that's totally acceptable. And I think that's actually almost like a requirement to get good in the, in the community. Yep, totally agree. And I've read that book as well. It was one of the first things that Pat recommended to me. And it was a really great read and very short read. But you can definitely knock it out in a day or a weekend. So highly recommend that. And, then we and if you if you have t uh, Amazon Prime, it's free. So it's like you don't even have like the there excuse that it costs money. Perfect. Uh, so one last question, Pat, and then we'll get mm -hmm. wrapped up here. But as you know, I, I know what you've been learning since this was created and what you've been working on since. So looking back now, is there anything you do differently in retrospect? Yeah, um, and it's funny, it's like what, so as I go down, like it, it breaks down the shows, it breaks down the seasons. These are all, the reason I didn't go over this is because it's all pretty simple and I think most people could figure it out pretty quickly and definitely with break with downloading the viz and breaking it down. It actually comes down to here. It's something that I don't do a lot. I was just kind of railing against adding text, but I thought it would add some value here. The thing that I would do different is uh, when you got, when the, you guys joined with the Boston tug, it's probably about 
two months ago now, I think, um, you had Brian Moore on and Brian Moore went over pagination or just paging. It's just digital paging. So it just means that you can flip through it the same way that you would like flip through a book or a, a digital book. Um, and I would add that in. I, I, I can't remember where I read it and I have to try and go back and find it. But I feel like there was some research done that found that scrolling was less intuitive than than paging or than, than pagination. And so that's probably something I would apply here. So you see here, there's a scroll bar on the right uh, or on the, yeah, on the right side over here. I would probably change, I would go download Brian Moore's, uh, I think it's a superstore uh, data set example, uh, kind of using, just basically using dummy data uh, and, and, and see how we did that and break it down. I think it has something to do with um, indexing, but I can't recall all that. It was a couple months ago. And like I said, my memory is not that great. I have young children, so that's my excuse. <laughs> and one last thing I'm gonna call out, it's just, um, it's a small detail, but it's one that I just really like about this dashboard. Um, Pat, would you click on one of those, uh, those shapes? Oh, right? yeah, it's been a while. I haven't, I think, I don't, I don't, I wonder if Steven can speak to this. Like, I feel like I, I put stuff out and I put so much of myself into it, some of these that I kind of, I don't go back into them very much after I create them, I'm kind of done with them at the time. I actually forgot that I even had this in here. It's a good point. So. Let me put this, I'll click on this one because this is the, the part that I really like. So there's like a, a brief scene of uh, Anthony Bourdain's trip to the Bay Area, which I, I, I enjoy San Francisco a lot. Um, and so he actually dropped in at, uh, at Half Gracie's gym and was uh, put a kind of a cool uh, jujitsu figure named um, uh, Kurt Osander in a show. I mean, this guy, like he never was expecting this, but he's a, he's a real interesting, interesting guy. And so he kind of shined a light on, and he didn't have to do that. And he would do that. Uh, occasionally when you travel he would just sh things he was passionate about he just like hey i'm going to put this guy in my show and uh and this this was an episode that kurt was largely featured in and i thought it was really cool so i just put it in there because it's my viz and i can do what i want <laughs> and i liked it and so i was like i can you know this is this is like this is how i interpret him as a as a, as a person in life uh so i think one of the cool things here that you were saying like i um i included this is just a, a hide show button and all i did is i created something i think in powerpoint and I just lowered the opacity. I think this, this is yellow. I, I'm actually colorblind. So, um, Brandon, correct me if I'm wrong. This is, I think this is yellow or like a goldish color. And uh, yeah. what I did is I just I just lowered the opacity to uh, pretty low. I can't remember exactly what it was. So that it would just be some indication that you would uh, you'd clicked on it uh, or clicked off. And so it's just, again, smoke and mirrors. There's nothing really that hard about this. It was just uh, something I kind of thought of. I was like, oh, that could be creative. Maybe that'll work. And tried it out and maybe I'll do it in uh, maybe I'll, some of the stuff that's cool about public is that you can actually take a lot of these learnings and apply that to work and, and vice versa. So I, I don't know if it all translates, actually probably a lot of the stuff I don't. I think one of the things that I definitely do is I, I try to, uh, I try to do things in public that I wouldn't do at work uh, oftentimes because that's where I can kind of like flex and enjoy myself. Yeah. And one thing I love about it is just that it gives, you know, like a lot of people probably wouldn't go through the extra trouble of adding it, but it gives the audience more context and helps them with the navigation, which is really nice. So, and Pat does a lot of that, just kind of detailing in his uh, work. As you scroll through his public page, you can definitely see that in all of his, in his work books. It's really great. I do like Easter eggs. <laughs> yep. so I guess just like Mark, just like Mark Bradburn. So. <laughs> all, all right. Well, thanks guys. Yeah, we're very glad you joined us today. Thank you for all the Great content. We'll try to get some links thrown in the chat for everybody to kind of track down some of those resources. I think Stephen and Tim have already been working on that. Um, but yeah, we, uh, be sure and check out Pat's uh, just social media, Twitter, LinkedIn, all that good stuff, public page, and uh, keep in touch with us. All right, guys. Thanks for having me. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna take my camera off so I don't have. To, I can like run around and do stuff. <laughs> Enjoy. <laughs> Thanks. Bye, guys. Thanks. All right, so uh, next uh, session up, um, we'll turn it over to Stephen. Um, do you want to kind of give a brief intro on, on kind of how this uh, session came about and kind of what your uh, thought process was and when you were putting it together? Yeah, thanks, Tim. Um, and Patrick's gone, but it was awesome to hear from him. His viz is uh, amazing. Um, so we're gonna talk about something decidedly probably less involved, but I think equally important here. Um, so why did I decide to do a little session on data tables? Well, first of all, um, I like to use Tableau. Uh, I like to build visualizations. I like to do those things, but also I use Tableau in my work environment. And one of the things that I hear very often in my work environment is, can I just see the data? Um, and, and 
that case, you know, it's it's all fine and dandy to have really great bar charts and um, really great line charts and, and all of those things. But when you get down to it, um, what a lot of people are comfortable with is going to be those data tables. And so I've noticed that it's not necessarily the thing that most people are interested in um, in doing in terms of their visualizations. But I think that when done well, they can be a really useful addendum to a lot of both personal and uh, professional uh, visualization. So today what I intend to talk about is some basic tips here. Um, if we feel we get a sense that there's an appetite for more involved um, table design, I'm happy to do follow-on sessions to kind of um, add additional uh, tips and techniques to, to continue building on this. Um, so with that in mind, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, can you see this? Can I Tim, can you hop back on and give me a thumbs up if you can see it? Yep, you're good. Okay, perfect. Okay, so data tables, design 101. So what I want to say first is data tables are visualizations. Okay, so I think oftentimes the thought process is that, hey, tables are tables. And then what I really want to do is put it into, you know, the line charts, the the, the fancy sun key charts, whatever um, chart that you're thinking of. but Data tables are visualizations. And so with that in mind, we need to think about them in the same way as we would any other visualization and think about how we apply um, data, basic data visualization principles to those. So what are the benefits of a well-designed table? Um, on the left here, this is a table that I, I posted on Tableau Public. Um, it's actually a remake of a table I, I saw somewhere else uh, by 538. And I wanted to push the table concept in Tableau to its limits to see what can we actually do with tables in Tableau. And so that's what I created. So you have the flags for the countries, you have um, the heat map that goes across multiple tables. Um, you have the conditional formatting so you can get the check marks. Once you really start breaking free of the idea of tables just have to be pure data, you can start freeing up to actually create these visualizations that make sense and work for the data. Um, so, you know, some of the benefits of the tables, most people are familiar with those. Most businesses, uh, business audiences, general audiences, they've seen a table before, especially if they're familiar with Excel and Google Sheets and those things. So it's quickly easy for them to understand. Um, it's very easy to create tables in Tableau, at least in the most basic sense. It doesn't require specialized knowledge um, to make make a table in Tableau. It's one of the quickest things to do. Um, it's an effective use of space. You can really condense a lot of information into a small space there, and it's, ex it's scalable. You know, if you were looking at um, connecting to a data uh, data source at work, um, you don't. It can sometimes lead to issues if there's outliers in the data set. Um, if you're using line charts and things like that, whereas tables makes it a little bit easier to work with. Um, some of the drawbacks, of course, is uh, it doesn't work well with huge aggregations. So, you know, it. The thing with tables is that as you continue to get more data, um, that's where Patrick was talking about pagination and, and scrolling. There is going to be a point where it's not as effective uh, as effective of a, a way to visualize information. So you got to know when to do that. Um, it's also not a shareable. Uh, it's not really something that most people think about, like are proud of and share with everyone. Um, so it's not as easily uh, shareable in that way. It's not as Pretty to look at generally. And if you do tables wrong, and um, they can be confusing to look at. Um, and you'll see why that happens in just a moment. So with that in mind, we're going to start with the first tip um, with text alignment. So how this is going to work is each slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the basic tips to help improve your tables. Um, and we'll go through the do's and uh, don'ts and do's for each one of those. And then at the end of this, we'll hopefully have a table that looks a little bit better. Um, so text alignment. This is pretty basic, guys. Text, when you're thinking about the text in your tables, you got to think about the way that people read and the way that people interpret the information. Um, so generally, you're going to want to have your numbers aligned to the right. Um, why to the right? Well, it helps people understand that there's no other data that's coming at the end. So there's no other additional decimal points. Um, they know that if it's aligned to the right, where it begins and ends is the full, full number, whereas it when it's aligned to the left, it kind of gives that gap, as you can see on the last month under the don't. Um, that gap can be a little bit unnerving to a lot of people. Um, and then the same thing with your um, left line with the text columns, uh, it just pretties it up. Um, what you're looking to do here is just keep 
as much consistency as possible. You can notice on the left-hand chart with inactive and active that there's a little bit of a kind of boom, boom, boom going on. Um, whereas when you look at the right, it's a straight line, and a lot that's just works better for people's you know visual, uh, visually understanding the information there. So that's a pretty basic tip um, with your alignments. Um, you also want to make sure that your alignments to uh, for the column names really fit the column content. So what I mean by that is not centering um, your column names if you have things left aligned. Um, try and keep those matching so it's a consistent visual scroll. Because what we're looking to do for people is to make it easy for them to quickly f move their eyes across the table and understand what's going on, which is the whole point of tables. Um, the second tip is size does matter. Um, so sorry, guys, a uh, little joke there. Um, the tip here is you want to make sure that your data has room to breathe. And this is probably something that you've heard before um, in terms of data visualization, a general pr generalized principle. But it applies to tables especially as well. You don't want it to feel compact and cramped because then the eyes can get confused. And that's where you have issues where someone loses themselves as they're going across the table trying to move across um, with their eyes. You don't want um, tell them to get lost. Um, in fact, generally, you know, sometimes there's no way you can avoid smaller rows, but if possible, I'd say never go with the default row heights and columns in Tableau. Really adjust that so that it has a lot of padding on each side uh, above and below so that you can get a nice um, visual cross um, as you move across there. The next tip is going to be the typography. So I if you look at the don't column, it's probably you're probably thinking to yourself like I would never do that. I went through Tableau Public um, just because I was trying to see what what kind of things I saw often, and I did see many uh, tables that were like this. Um, my suggestion for your typography and your tables. Um, I use Arial most of the time with in terms of font, but you generally just don't want to go with any serif fonts, any slab fonts, anything that is going to make it a little bit harder to read. As you can see in the left-hand side, you know, it's in all caps, it's in a, a Times New Roman. It's hard to kind of like parse what that name is. And then when you move across, you see um, weird bolding going on, uh, weird inconsistent sizing, and there's nothing wrong with having bold in your table, but you wanna use it effectively. Generally, the first item in your table should be um, the element that you're keying people in on so they can quickly locate and boom, 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 and move across. Um, so when you're thinking about typography in, in terms of a table, really try and keep that consistent consistency and also try and keep, uh, don't put anything unusual in there. Um, so none of those comic sans, no tablet public doesn't allow you to do that, but um, none of those weird fonts should be inside of your table. The next tip here, and you can see we're kind of moving through these, is the data ink ratio. I think Patrick brought it up uh, earlier. And what you want to do with your tables is really be ruthless in how you remove items, uh, things that don't matter. Um, so sometimes this may be a column if it's not helpful for the analysis, but also this is going to be, I generally don't like to use the row banding um, if possible. I know the idea is that it helps with the pre-attentive properties and allows you to quickly um, move through and see separate separate the rows. I don't think that's not so much of an issue. Um, and so I generally recommend removing that. What you're looking to do is kind of reduce that that load. And when people see colors and people see things, uh, different kind of column slices, it can really um, take them off track when really what they're trying to do is quickly move through this table. So in your, um, in your uh, tables, really think about like, does this need to be here? Do I need this color? Do I need this column? Do I need this? Um, and making sure that you're, you're thinking about those things. And so with that, I want to show what a before table, this is what you would get in the default kind of Tableau world. And then on the right hand is what, using those properties that I listed before, what a table could look like um, and something that is easy, easily digestible for a stakeholder or a business or or whatever you're using it for. And you know, there's some things I didn't mention here, like the active and inactive, and why that's colored. Uh, and like I said before, if there's an appetite for really diving deep into table design, I'm happy to do that here with you guys in this group. Um, just let us know. 
Um, but what I hope that you can get from the day is if you're already making tables, um, if you just apply that extra 10, 20 minutes of really taking the time to format them, think about what you're doing with them, think about how people will read this, you can really improve um, the effectiveness of your tables. And when someone says to show me the data, you can know that they're not going to come back to you and um, be confused. You can know that they'll be able to effectively understand that data as you give it to them. Um, so my closing thoughts, uh, good design is like a refrigerator. When it works, no one notices, but when it doesn't, it sure stinks. Uh, I, I say that because you know when you see a bad table or a table that's hard to read, it really does stick out in your mind. Um, and tables do matter. You know, As data professionals and hopefully da aspiring data visualization experts, we really should be thinking about even the smallest things you're trying to do them well, making it a point to not um, just lessen our laurels for things that are a little bit less sexy than, say, the bar charts and the line charts, um, <clears throat> and uh, put ourselves in a place that we're really doing even the most simple things uh, well. And that's it. Tim? Awesome. Yeah, thank you, Stephen. So one of the reasons um, kind of I, I, I love this presentation is one of the things you learn early on when you're, when you're learning data viz is how to leverage pre tender attributes. And I think uh, tables like this are one of the best um, examples of that, right? Whether it's a, a highlight table or, you know, some KPI indicators, um, this is a really good way to kind of draw out those pre tender attributes, leverage color, leverage size, those sort of things. So it's one of the reasons I love this uh, presentation. So awesome job, Stephen. Hey, Steve. Yeah. Even real quick, uh, can you go back to the uh, do and don't your last one, your 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 final product? Yeah, before and after. So uh, uh, Kelly and Kim, I'm not sure if it's Kelly or Kim, uh, is on, but they had a question regarding the check marks. So I wanted to ask you because I'm in, uh, I sort of want to understand how uh, you go about it. The text column. So you're obviously dragging one or two calculations to the text column. Mm -hmm. So here, here's the simplest way. Oh, well, the way that I did it is for each, uh, for the X and for the check, you create two calculated fields. Um, in fact, let me see, it may be worth just pulling this up so you guys can get an idea. Um, I'm going to share the tableau. Yeah. Okay. So we're looking at this. So everyone does it a bit different. Yep. Sure. Um, so I'll explain how I do it. And Joe, if you have a more effective way, um, please let me know. Um, the way that I handle it is by doing uh, a separate field for each. So you have check is if status is true. So this is the dummy data set I'm working with. So true represented active, false represented act inactive. Um, so if that, then the check, else it's null. Um, and then the same thing with X. So if false, then X else null. Um, and then that way, what you can do is you can actually color those inside of the text box and then it'll appear um, when, when you uh, create the table. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, so um, yeah. So I think everyone sort of goes about it the same way. Uh, I would have created a calculation, one for active, and then use some sort of wing ding to allow you to create that check mark. And then I would have had one that was for inactive. So two formulas, one for active, one inactive. Um, and then one with the inactive, just with an X. And then, yeah, same yeah. same, uh, same technique, just dragging both the text and coloring one red and then coloring one green. Uh, looks like here you use that status to to control the colors on the color mark. So very cool. Yeah. Yeah. And like I said before, um, you know, if you guys in the group are here, we're here for you as well. So if you guys are really like, hey, you know, I really want to learn how Steven does more things with tables, happy to dive into that. Um, it, it would be a little bit more involved, but I, I'm willing to do so if, if there's an appetite for it in this group. Hey, well, thank you for sharing. Tim, you are on mute. All right, my bad. Um, yeah, so thank you, Stephen. That was uh, 
That was great. Um, so one last thing we want to do before we uh, kind of depart for the day is uh, we promised a tip of the month. So I'm going to go through that now. Um, share my screen. So uh, one of the things I uh, try to make an effort to do each day, or at least a couple times a week, is uh, go on the forums, Tableau Community Forums, see if I can answer a couple questions. Um, not only does it help somebody else out, but it keeps my skills sharp, um, kind of keeps me on my toes and keeps me thinking. A lot of times in our day jobs, we're doing the same repetitive tasks or creating the same type of charts. So hearing other people's use cases or other people's obstacles um, kind of helps me uh, keep, keep some fresh ideas. Uh, something that came up recently was a user was looking to give their explorer, so whether that's a manager, director, uh, someone who's not physically developing or building a dashboard, they're looking to give that user the ability to uh, kind of drag and drop their own pills and create their own view. While that's not necessarily possible, um, we were able to solve the issue using kind of a series of parameters where the end user could ultimately change the axis, whether the X or Y, and uh, kind of create the view they needed or wanted. So I'm going to show you kind of how to do that. Um, and what I'm going to do it with is we're going to, let me get some stuff out of the way here. We're going to do it with, uh, I'm going to do a scatter plot. So to start it off, I'm going to do sales, maybe I'll do profit. And uh, let's use, well, just for simplicity's sake, we'll use subcategory. Uh, eh, well, maybe I'll use, uh, let's see how product ID looks. Whoops. Yeah, let's use product ID. So <clears throat> what you need to do to be able to create this dynamic axis is one, you're going to create a parameter for both axes. You're going to do, uh, let's do Y. I'm going to call it metric change parameter and make this a string and a list. And here we're going to list out all the possible, uh, all the possible measures the end user wants to change to. So we know sales, profit, um, hey, maybe we want discount and um, shoot, let's put in quantity as well. Now, quantity is a little bit different. Uh, in that it's going to be a count, um, an actual um, uh, two-digit integer as, as opposed to a dollar amount, like sales, profit, and discount would be. So that's something to keep in mind as you're making your list. Ultimately, if you want to format these a certain way, um, the values you put in here have to be of the same format. So we're going to go ahead and hit OK on that. And I'm going to create another one exactly the same. Second, went to the wrong screen. So same thing. This will be a string list sales profit. And what we need to connect these to the viz. So whenever you make a parameter, you always need to find a way to connect it to your actual view. Um, as now, it's not going to do anything, right? So we need to link these with calculated fields into our into our viz here. So we'll do what we'll uh, how we'll do that is use a case statement for each one of those uh, parameters. Let's start with x. We're going to say when the user selects sales, then I want to return the sales measure. We're going to do the same thing for the other three. That's an excellent discount. All right, 
So this calculated field, like I said, will connect the parameter to our view. And what I'm going to do is actually duplicate that. And I want to go in and edit it for my Y. In there. Okay, so what I'm going to do now, let me just fix that name as well, is I'm going to replace the pills we have on our rows and columns with those change calculations. And what this will allow me to do is now I can go to this parameter change the values I'm measuring on each axis. So I thought I wanted to say, see how many products um, are getting discounts, uh, the quantity of products getting discounts, or um, maybe the sales of a particular product um, uh, and how it, uh, how it ties to quantity. So you can see right off the bat, that's, uh, maybe we should put uh, product name in there as well. We can see what that is. So things like this might jump out at you, right? So you have a product here, a copier that, uh, oh, I should have labeled these a little bit better, but uh, quantity is only 20, but uh, you have sales over 60,000. Right? So I might tell you something real quick that maybe that's a high ticket item. So uh, that's our tip of the month uh, for this month. Uh, dynamic axes using parameters. Um, this can lead to a lot of things. Uh, you can use kind of the same concept in, um, I've used it in contained statements before when I'm doing a wildcard search on a note field or um, maybe names or something like that. So, so parameters are powerful things, have a lot of use cases, and this is just one example. So with that. Um, that hey, uh, before, yeah. we, before we move on, can you can you go ahead and go to your, uh, your, your title? Add a layer for the worksheet and add in those two parameters. Great point. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so let's see. Yeah, and just throw verses in there. And we'll even do, um, do this as well. Well, that's not what I intended. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I missed you up there. Uh, no, 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 you're good. You're good. I should have, uh, I should have planned to put subcategory and product name in the title. But what Joey is, uh, the the point we're kind of trying to emphasize here is, um, you can create that dynamic title, leveraging those parameters, so the user can see, uh, you know, what the range is they're looking at, whether it be, uh, you know, dollar amounts or in this case quantities. Uh, that I have any x-axis here. Um, so there's a couple different ways we can make those discrete. Uh, we're running short on time, so we're not going to get into those today. That can be something we cover in a future uh, future session. But um, yeah, no, that is a good point, though, Joey, is uh, making sure you yeah, leverage real quick. those parameters to make a dynamic title. Yeah, instead of doing the calc there, how you have uh, exchange calc, do the parameter. I was trying to get it to the title, see if they could. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See sorry. that right now you're doing quantity versus profit. Yeah, you're good. So just why he's doing this, parameters are extremely powerful. Uh, I use this technique a lot. I love it. I love to give the user the ability to say, hey, I want to look at this metric versus this metric. If you throw a trend line down here, go ahead and uh, right click and throw a trend line. Yeah, let's do something. Let me find a different tab. That might be a good one. Yeah, and sometimes, you know, if you go back and do quantity versus uh, profit or something. Maybe quantity. Yeah, anyways. Yeah. Uh, no, it's a great technique. I appreciate it. Absolutely. 
Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute and we can uh, kind of address those if anyone has questions for Patrick or Stephen. Um, I know folks have been popping them in the chat, but uh, we'd like to leave a few minutes at the end for uh, folks to get in questions. If not, uh, let me hop back to my workbook here. Whoops. If not, we'll leave you with this. Um, uh, thanks for kind of joining us today. Thanks for hanging out with us. Uh, join us on LinkedIn. We actually have a uh, Twitter account as well, which is NTX underscore TUG. Uh, I'm not sure what happened. It's supposed to be displaying there, but uh, that's where we share kind of uh, all our, our meeting updates, um, our you know updates for our uh, next event, which I'm not sure if we're going to try to have one in November or not, but uh, TBD on that. Will be shared there. Um, any kind of cool content we find kind of in the public space, we like to share on um, on Twitter and LinkedIn as well. So if you're not already a member of that group, uh, join us there. Um, Stephen, Brandy, Joey, any kind of final thoughts before we sign off? Yeah, I'd just like to thank uh, Pat for uh, presenting today. We're definitely going to have to bring him back. It seems as if he has a wealth of knowledge. So. Absolutely. Definitely love to have him back. Stephen, thank you so much. Um, great addition to the team. Brandy, same thing. Having you guys, uh, you know, join the committee here has been, uh, has been a great, you know, for me and, and great for Tim as well. So I appreciate, appreciate having you guys on board. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate right. it. Thanks, guys. Talk to you guys next month. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.